Land reform is one of the thorniest issues confronting South Africa. In this video, I break down this issue and show how South Africa has failed so dramatically since 1994 to come to grips with the question of land. Spread the fire, welcome back to the channel fam. We call this channel SMWX, that stands for the Cizwe Mbofu Welsh Experience. If you're new around here, I'm Dr. Cizwe Mbofu Welsh. And on this channel, we explore South African politics through interviews and analysis. And in this video, I wanna have a look at a particular issue and do a deep dive on this question of land reform. This is a thorny question. It's a hot button issue in South Africa, but often, Temperatures are raised, but the facts of this question are left outside the door. And we really need to look at land reform in South Africa and take a, a sober look at what has gone wrong, what it is, and where South Africa needs to go to achieve a vision of a more just and equitable system of land ownership. So in this video, I'm gonna look firstly at what land reform is because land reform is often spoken about, but seldom is it really unpacked in its different elements. So I'm going to first define what land reform really means in three different dimensions. After that, I'm gonna look into land redistribution, land restitution, and tenure reform. Those are the three dimensions of land reform, and I'm gonna break them down in turn, and also explain how dramatically South Africa has failed in all of those three different areas of land reform. So let's get started. Right, let's begin with what is land reform. And in South Africa, land reform really rests on three prongs. There's restitution, there's redistribution, and there's tenure reform. So let me explain and define each of those in turn. Restitution is when you have a specific piece of land and you can show documentary and evidence that there was land dispossession and the victims of that land dispossession or their heirs want to gain restoration of the land that was dispossessed. So person A unjustifiably gained ownership of land. They probably evicted some family through apartheid laws maybe even forcibly, that family has evidence of this eviction and they want to gain restitution, i.e. they want the land back, basically. So it's about specific acts of dispossession and specific acts of restoration. By contrast, land redistribution, which is the one that people often and most commonly speak about, is not about specific acts of dispossession and specific acts of restoration. It's more about the broader fairness in society and the fact that because of centuries of dispossession and many decades of apartheid law, South Africa has a deeply racially unequal distribution of land and it's in the best interests of the country that that distribution moves from its feudal kind of tiny minority of predominantly white landowners into a much fairer, much wider ownership structure. So it's not about my family was moved from this land in 1893. It's about South Africa's land ownership is just grossly unfair. And to become a more just society, we need to make that more fair. So even if you may have acquired your land perfectly fairly, but you continue to contribute to the, the racial inequality of land ownership in South Africa, for example, there's still an overriding social imperative for a more fair and equitable distribution of land. So land redistribution is about the overall fairness of the picture of land ownership in South Africa. Then there's a third kind of land reform, which is about tenure reform. Now, maybe you watching have family who live in a rural area in South Africa who live in Matkoseni as Lalin, for example, in rural KZN, Limpopo, in these areas, you'll know well that people have the right to occupy land, but they aren't the ultimate owners of that land. So someone right now in a, in a village in the Eastern Cape who's lived in that village their whole lives, 
doesn't actually own the land on which they reside. They have pure occupancy rights, but the state owns the land ultimately. And this is a system of land ownership that traces all the way back to colonial dispossession. And unfortunately, as we'll see, the democratic state has failed to reform those kind of colonial occupancy relationships. So having defined land reform, I'm now gonna move on to these different kinds of land reform, see what's been done since 1994, and try and assess why we are so far back in the plan to reform land in South Africa. Okay, so let's talk about restitution first. Remember, restitution is about a specific act of dispossession. So some person forcibly removed, evicted, dispossessed some other person and their family, and now we want to restore the situation, which is a very basic legal principle that runs through various forms of law, restitution. Now, here, government claims many victories that are actually hollow when you look into them more deeply. So, in 1994, government opened up the restitution process. So they said, look, if you have evidence that your family was dispossessed of land, then we're gonna open up a window, you can apply to get restitution and we will restore the land. And that was wonderful in theory. Um, when the act was passed, it was this big moment and everyone thought that, wow, South Africa's really moving towards land restitution. But unfortunately, in the three decades that followed, even though many people did apply, they did not really get what was due to them. Now, why do I say that? Now, if you look at the actual applications, what you find is that government started to bow under the administrative burden of this process, number one, and the sheer financial cost of actually buying all the land for people that was required. So effectively what they did was they said, okay, we can't just buy all this land, we don't have enough money, it's too much of an administrative burden. What we're going to do is we are going to effectively give people symbolic financial compensation. So instead of actually getting the land, you, you got a choice. You could say, okay, I want to get the land back or nothing else, or I'm gonna take this symbolic financial compensation. And what happened? Well, since a lot of people were in poverty, unemployment, living in a, one of the most unequal economies on record, they chose the money. Now the money unfortunately bore no relation to the actual land. So there were really meager sums that were offered to people and they took it because they were desperate. So, you know, as little as 5,000 Rand could sometimes be given to an entire family. You know, if you divide that by 10, it really becomes a slap in the face. Um, so anywhere between five and 15,000 Rand was the average of the symbolic financial compensation. But you can see that as more people started taking the symbolic financial compensation, I think it was around 80% of the claimants eventually opted for this because the, the other process was just too long and too onerous. We didn't actually restore land to people. We just gave them a financial pat on the head we impoverished the government further. And unfortunately, the people who actually were the beneficiaries of dispossession walked away with the best part of the deal. They often didn't lose any land, nor did they actually have to pay for the restitution because the government assumed all the responsibility for that. So restitution has actually, in my view, been a catastrophe. People have not been restored to their land all too often. They've got symbolic financial compensation. And this is the inequality that exists because in another part of land reform, which I'll get onto a bit later, redistribution, for decades we had a policy where people would often get paid market compensation. So the beneficiaries of, of, of dispossession got market-related compensation, but the actual victims got symbolic compensation. Now, either everyone gets symbolic compensation or everyone gets market compensation, but you can't have a system in which the very people who most need 
the restitution are the people who get symbolic compensation and the people who benefited from the previous system are the ones who get market compensation. So we had a very, and still have in many ways, a very confused policy of land reform where all the burdens fall on the state and very few of the burdens actually fall on the people who benefited from dispossession where there's documentary evidence that that dispossession occurred. Okay, so let's move on to land redistribution. What is land redistribution? Well, remember here, this is not about specific acts of dispossession and specific acts of restoration. It's about just trying to make a fairer, more just society. And it's amazing to think when you look at it that nearly two thirds of South Africa's land mass. So if you look at the country, if you look at a map, how much of South Africa's commercial agricultural land, farms and things like that, it's actually around two thirds of the country. So, you know, most South Africans live in cities, which are actually very small areas in terms of land mass. They're very densely populated. So if you look at South Africa, the majority of people live in a very confined space, but the majority of the land is actually quite wide open and is commercial, often commercial agricultural land. I've written a book chapter on this, so if you want the reference, check the link down below for all the different references and the reports that I've looked at. But effectively what you have is somewhere between 40 and 50,000 commercial interests really dominating the ownership of two thirds of this, of the country, of all this commercial agricultural land. So you have a system which is basically feudal in, in my view, and to make matters worse, also racially skewed so you have this kind of landed aristocracy, which is a remnant of apartheid and colonialism, which still owns the disproportionate amount of commercial agricultural land in the country. And that's just an untenable, grossly unjust situation from any perspective and any definition. So the question is, what's been done over three decades to try and reform that? Well, in 1994, President Mandela, um, his government set about trying to achieve something here. And the goals that were set were by 2014, so that was within 20 years, they wanted to redistribute 30% of commercial agricultural land. Now that's a very conservative goal, right? Like. We don't even want the majority of commercial agricultural land in two decades to be in the hands of black South Africans. So you can criticize the goal, but fine, the goal was set. Where are we now? Well, it's a long time since even 2014. And we have failed to redistribute any more than 8% of the commercial agricultural land. So even the very narrow goals that were set have been totally missed and there's simply no accountability it's hardly ever spoken about but it seems like every year a new goal gets set the goalposts get shift, shifted again but the original promise never there's never an explanation for for why it's been missed and broken and it's really quite a travesty when you look at the prioritization of this issue. So for example, the South African budget is creeping towards two trillion rands, but a glance at budgetary proposals for the 2021 financial year will show you that the land reform budget is around 11 billion. And the re redistribution budget is a fraction of that, somewhere around 3 billion. So you can see that the prioritization of this issue demonstrates government's deprioritization of land reform. And the deprioritization leads to a further problem because not enough money is devoted to the administrative burden of actually creating this reform and the applications that have to be made and processed that not only is there deprioritization, but there is a major administrative logjam which has prevented even the small goals from being achieved. And it's quite scandalous. There's also a funny myth 
in terms of redistribution, that in order to redistribute land, we have to train a generation of farmers. Now, this is completely misguided. You don't need to be a farmer in order to be a landowner. That's like saying you have to be a bricklayer in order to own property. Land ownership and farming are two different but interrelated things. So you can think of it like this. Where there's a commercial farm, there are actually two assets in one place. There's the land, and then there's the business that happens to be on top of the land. Now, you can actually disaggregate those things, and you can transfer the ownership of the land while retaining the ownership of the business that's on the land. And then the business that's on the land could pay rent to the new landowner, for example. So you don't have to be a farmer in order to own land on which a farm actually happens to be doing business any more than you have to be an electrician or an architect to own property. So all this talk about we need to train a generation of farmers is actually misguided. We simply need to redistribute land and the assets that are on top of that land also can be redistributed and more just and equitable, but we don't need to wait until uh, millions and millions of farmers have been trained to actually achieve justice now. Okay, so let's talk about tenure reform. Now remember, tenure reform is when you change land rights. So instead of people in rural areas, for example, occupying land but not owning it, you actually change the land rights so that they become the owners of that land, they can trade that land as an asset, and you engage in a massive redistribution of wealth towards the rural population particularly black rural population that's been dispossessed for so many decades and centuries. Now, unfortunately, although government set about changing these relationships and ending this colonial system of occupancy rights, it has really backpedaled on these promises and come up with a plan that involves, in my view, the re of South Africa, where traditional councils, which are in turn linked to traditional leaders, would own, this is the new proposal, they would own this land on behalf of the many millions of people often who, who would fall within that jurisdiction. And so you would effectively create a new land owning elite, but the problem with this is that the link between the traditional council and the actual ultimate person on the land shows no sign of, of becoming more just and more equitable. You just create a new buffer layer in between the state and the individual. So we have a real question on our hands. We have 20 million people in South Africa, roughly, who occupy land but don't own it. You don't need to kick anyone off that land. They're already on the land. How do we give them ownership of the land that is rightfully theirs? How do we transfer rightfully ownership to the occupants currently of that land in such a way that it isn't a fleeting and ephemeral victory where that land gets rebought by big commercial interests the minute that it gets transferred in such a way that we don't create a re of South Africa where traditional leaders who sure have a role to play in South Africa but don't become new land barons at the expense of the people who deserve it most? And how do we create a system in which that redistribution of wealth sticks and becomes the most important redistribution of wealth in the country's history? So tenure reform is not spoken about a lot, but it may be in some ways the most important part of land reform because it's about people's rights. It's about breaking the legacy of colonialism once and for all and entrenching wealth within one of the most dispossessed segments of South African society. So that's a really big headache because there are major interests involved, there is a great deal at stake and it's something that South Africa really has to get right. Sadly, up to now for three decades, government has effectively sat on its hands and failed to grasp the nettle of tenure reform. So fam, that's a breakdown of land reform in South Africa. As I say, I've written a book chapter on this 
link down below. You can check that out. It's in my book, Democracy and Delusion. It breaks it down. It has a lot more resources if you want to follow up on some of these issues. I'm keen to hear your thoughts. I always engage down in the comments. We have a very lively comment section on this channel. So give me your thoughts. What do you think about the question of land reform, about the failures over three decades to get serious about land reform? How do we get this right in South Africa? We can't just ignore it. It's the key, it's the royal road to our justice and stability vision. And if we don't get it right, it threatens to plunge our country into inequality, deeper inequality and further, further poverty, deprivation and chaos. So how do we do this? Give me your thoughts. Let's let's bring this back onto the agenda. Let's have a real conversation about land reform in the country and how we how we get it right. Um, you know, it's it's really great to have you as a subscriber. If you're a subscriber, I really appreciate it. Uh, the channel is doing so well this year. Um, since we moved to this new format of, of analysis, there'll be other interviews as well coming on the channel. So, you know, make sure you drop a like, subscribe, share this with friends. You know, this is not a mainstream channel. I'm trying to build something alternative and it survives purely on word of mouth. So I rely on you to share on Twitter, Instagram, anywhere. If you want to tweet me, tag me at Cesar and Bofo Walsh, hashtag SMWX. I'll retweet you. Let's keep building this. Let's keep spreading the fire and see you very soon for the next video. Aye.